Welcome to the How to College series, sponsored by the Virginia Tech Department of Engineering Education. In this video, we'll teach you a study strategy called metacognitive problem solving that will help you learn to conceptualize important abstract ideas and apply them in concrete situations. Practice is an essential part of mastering any activity. But the best practice is reflective practice, practice in which you look back on what it is that you're doing. When should you engage in this type of practice when it comes to learning things academically? Usually after the relevant class lecture is a good time, but definitely the bulk of your study time should be spent practicing. What should you practice? Definitely math, physics, chemistry, any kind of class where you're learning a process. The strategy that we're going to use is called a metacognitive problem solving. The word metacognition just means thinking about how you're thinking. To use this reflective practice strategy, you'll of course need sample problems to work on. You can find problems in your textbook, old tests that your instructor gives out, or like this one, through a Google search. We'll start with something relatively simple, a molality problem from general chemistry. To find it, I just searched molality problems. You'll want to find problems with multiple levels of difficulty and complexity for this. But most importantly, you'll want to find sources of problems that include the answers so that you can check yourself. Let's begin. A 0.391 molality solution of the solute hexane dissolved in the solvent benzene is available. Calculate the mass in grams of the solution that must be taken to obtain 247 grams of hexane. The answer is 7,580 grams. The first thing I'm going to do is write where I got this problem at the top of the paper. I want to be able to come back to this problem in the future because this practice problem will be a study tool. You may even want to just write the entire problem out on your paper. Next, draw a vertical line from the top of the page to the bottom. You'll want to have a bit more writing space on the right side than the left, maybe around twice as much. On the left side, I'm going to start solving the problem like I normally would. I know this is a molality problem, so I'm going to start by writing the molality equation. If I was doing this problem for homework or on a test, I would just move on to the next step in the problem. But this is reflective practice, so I'm going to engage in some metacognition, thinking about how I'm thinking. So on the right side, I'm going to write out my thought process for what I just did. I took an action, writing the molality equation, so I'm going to describe what I did, but more importantly, I'm describing the reason that I did it. For every step in the problem, I'm going to write what I did and why I did it. This is directly connecting abstract theory, which is what you're supposed to be learning, to concrete application, which is how you're actually tested. This is also a chance to highlight important concepts. The modality equation is a key concept here, so I make sure to underline my reference to it. When I come back later to study the stuff before the test, this underline will draw my attention to this key concept. I continue solving the problem my way, and it's important for me to note this. This is how I solve this type of problem. This process is mapping out how I think about molality problems. You may take a completely different approach to molality problems, and that's okay. What's important is that you explore your own understanding of how these problems are done. That's different from looking up how to solve a problem on Khan Academy or some other online learning platform. It may make sense when you're watching someone else do it, but if you try it the same way and get lost, then that means that their way doesn't work for you. You have to improve your own way of solving problems so that when the test comes around and you're on your own, the problem solving process feels more natural. So I continue writing out my thought process and I underline the concepts that I feel are important. Maybe those concepts are simple, maybe they're hard to grasp, doesn't matter. What matters is that I feel they're important as I'm using them. Over time, you'll see that you underline fewer and fewer concepts as you use them more and more, and they become almost like common sense to you. That means you're learning. Let's return to the problem solving process. Notice that I'm writing on the right side here before doing anything on the left to match it. That's okay, I'm just planning ahead. In this step, I'm planning to get an equation for the mass of the solvent and call it by the variable name y. Now on the left, I execute the plan that I just outlined, and I do end up with an equation for the mass of the solvent that I've called y, but I didn't stop there. I actually went ahead and plugged that equation for y into the equation for x that I developed. 
Because I went further than I had written out, I now have to write out what I just did and why I did it. I write out the remainder of my actions and justify them with my reasons, just like I've been doing. But there's something I want you to notice. Look at the tenses of the verbs. In the part that I wrote earlier, I was planning out what I was about to do. So the verbs are future tense, will plug, will use. In the part that I wrote afterwards, I was describing what I had just done. So the verbs are in the past tense, used, plugged. It seems like an odd thing to point out. I mean, we're doing chemistry, not English, right? In order to fully understand your thought processes, it's not only important to write down the content of what you're thinking, but to write out the sequence in which you consider that content. What's triggering your thoughts? What can you execute quickly without that much thought? And what causes you to stop for a second to plan out your next steps? In this case, you can tell that I have to stop to strategize about what approach I'm going to take to set up my equations, but that once I have my equations, I can quickly combine them with little effort, so my algebra skills are strong. Now you know what I'm good at and what I need to work on. You also know that problems that require setting up a lot of different equations will take me longer than problems that are just plug and chug type questions. Using proper verb tenses can help you map out the sequence of your thoughts. Very often, it's the order in which you think of content rather than your mastery of the content that causes issues with understanding. What do you do when you're working on a problem and you have an issue moving forward? After all, if you always got problems right the first time you worked them, you wouldn't need to study. In this case, I realize that I'm going to need the chemical formula for hexane, but I don't know it, so I'm stuck. This is exposing a gap in my knowledge, which is actually a very good thing. You want to find all the gaps in your knowledge during practice so that you don't discover them during your test. So I'm going to take a red marker or a highlighter or a different colored pen, something that stands out, and I'm going to circle this part of my notes where I'm stuck. This does not show a bad thing. This shows an opportunity. Now I have a very precise question that I need to find an answer to. What is the chemical formula for hexane? That's simple enough that I can look it up in my textbook or Google it, but other questions might be more complex and require me to talk to a tutor at the Student Success Center or go to office hours to talk to my professor about it. But if I just went to my professor and asked, well, how do I solve this? More than likely, the professor is going to go through the whole problem. It's understandable. They don't know what I know and what I don't know. So that broad question is going to get a broad answer. When I can identify the specific issues I'm having moving forward, I can formulate a more precise question and surgically strike at the real problem instead of having to waste my time and my professor's time with them explaining something that I get 80% of. I continue the problem solving process, then continue describing and explaining my actions in the process. Since I ran into a gap in my knowledge, I also lay out how I fix that issue and if possible, tips for the future. I then continue the process. As you can tell, this can get tedious. It'll be tempting to just run through the problem without documenting everything. Over time, you'll be able to create a shorthand for your documentation, but when you're learning, it's important to be patient and humble. Remember, there's a reason you're doing it this way, and that reason is that you need to learn to do this in a test environment. Doing it slowly now to get the technique right will pay off later when you have to do it during a test in real time. I continue solving the problem and documenting my thought process all the way to the end. I now have a final answer, so I need to check it against the actual answer. Yikes, I am way off. I definitely messed something up here. So I take note of the fact that something is wrong. Hey, I found another gap in my knowledge. I have an opportunity to learn, so... I circle this spot in red marker. I might go through the book to see what I did wrong, I might go back through the problem to see if I made a tiny calculation mistake somewhere, or I might need to go see my instructor if I can't figure this out. In this case, office hours are going to be the resource that I use. After talking to my professor, I realized that I made a simple unit mistake. The molality equation uses kilograms of solvent, but I was using grams of solvent. I make a note that I had to go to office hours to fix this. I put a little reminder that I need to keep track of my units. I wrote this in red ink because it was a major problem that would have killed my performance on a test. I wouldn't even have known that I had a problem if I didn't already have the answer. That's unlike my previous issue where I knew I was stuck. 
I used the same red pen to fix my process on the left side, marking through the stuff I got wrong and replacing it with the correct steps. There's a reason I'm using red pen here. First, it's going to call attention to trouble spots when I go back to review. But also, in a subtle way, it reminds me that what I'm doing here is grading myself. In college, we often ask you to be your own teacher. But if you're going to be your own teacher, you'd better have a way to test yourself. We've now finished one problem using metacognitive problem solving. But this isn't the end. I mean, it's not like I know how to do all molality problems now. This becomes part of our notes, and we reference it when we do the next molality problem. We human beings don't learn abstract ideas in math and science directly. We learn them by applying those ideas in many different situations. Those different situations, in this case, can be different problems. This time we have a problem from the textbook. What is the molality of NaCl in an aqueous solution in which the mole fraction of NaCl is 0 0.100? The answer is 6.17 molality. So we apply the same process of metacognitive problem solving. I've jumped ahead a little and worked this one out so that you can see the full solution. Feel free to pause and look over the problem and my metacognitive notes. This time I have the previous problem to use as a reference. Notice that I'm applying what I learned in the last problem. Last time I got tripped up on the units, grams versus kilograms. This time I adjusted the way I approached the problem to avoid that same mistake. Mistakes are a natural part of learning. You can't help but make mistakes when you try something new. The secret to being successful is to learn from those mistakes and try not to make the same mistake twice. It's also pretty important to note what concepts show up every time I work this type of problem and which only show up in certain situations. For example, pretty much every molality problem you work is going to involve the molality equation. On the other hand, I didn't have to draw a hydrocarbon during the second problem, and I didn't have to deal with mole fractions during the first problem. Observations like these will help you distinguish between information that is central to the concept and information that is completely contextual. This solved problem now becomes part of my notes like the last one, so that I can reference it for the next problem. We just continue working through problems like this, one after another. Use the information that you learn with each mistake from one problem to the next. Solve problems over and over. Check your work. Take note of your mistakes. Add the problems to your notes. Over time, you'll notice that you're making fewer and fewer mistakes. The principles that you're learning will become embedded in your mind so that eventually you don't need to keep referencing your notes. Then, when it's time to take your test, you have this great set of notes that is tailor-made for the way that you best understand concepts, making it easy to refresh yourself on the material and nail your test. Why rely on someone else's study guide when you can make one perfect for yourself? Who could do a better job of teaching you than you? If you have any questions about metacognitive problem solving or any other study strategy, please feel free to reach out to your general engineering academic advisor or consider attending an in-person Wade workshop on study strategies in the future. Thank you for watching.